All right, if you have a Bible today, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20. I'm going to speak today on faint-heartedness. That's a long word, and it's a good word if we see how the Lord helps us with that. Um, faint-heartedness basically means cowardice uh, on the extreme definition. But the minor definition would mean just a want of courage, just losing courage where you would be faint of heart. And so we'll see what the Lord does with that. Um, I know we are to encourage one another. That's a real important thing. Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. How can a man have wisdom except he have a heart to it? We ask God to strengthen our hearts when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with the heart man believeth unto salvation. So the heart is talking about our emotions. It's talking about what is real deep down inside of us. It's being very sincere. And when we talk about faint-heartedness, that means our courage leaves us. So let's pray and then we'll see what the Lord has for us. Amen. Father. Bless your word today. Strengthen our hearts. Minister to us, Lord. Difficult times, and uh, sometimes we get weak, and we pray you just give us grace and strength today. For your honor, for your glory, help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, David, when he was going to fight Goliath, uh, nobody else would. Nobody else had the had the strength or the courage to do that. And David comes along and he says, is there not a cause? And so the cause is what gave him strength. But it was not only the cause, it was what God had done for him in the past. I've killed a lion, I've killed a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be just like that. So God will help me. So when he went out to that battle, it was an important battle because whoever won that between the two champions, the other uh, tribes would be subservient to them. They would be defeated. And so David defeated the giant, and it was a great victory. The Bible calls it a great, great victory. Um, there was another time later in life, and this seemed to be David's uh, way of doing things. He always trusted the Lord. He and his men were out fighting, and uh, they were coming back to where their families, their children and wives were, the city of Ziklag, and from a distance they saw smoke. And so the closer they got, they saw that the city was on fire. When they got there, they realized that the enemy had come and taken their families captive, ransacked the city. And uh, they wept until they had no more power to weep. These men, their families are gone, their children are gone. And they spake of stoning David. Uh, you wouldn't think they would have responded like that, but since David was out fighting, they had to blame David. And so David encouraged himself in the Lord. And he prayed and he asked God, should I go after them? And God said, yeah, go after them and you're going to recover all. And that's exactly what they did. He encouraged himself and then he encouraged those men to follow him. We find in Deuteronomy chapter 1, Moses is going to speak to the children of Israel, but Moses gets this message from the Lord. In Deuteronomy 1.38, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. They've been in the wilderness. And Deuteronomy 1.38, the Bible says, But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither, encourage him. Why did God and Moses say to the people, encourage Joshua? It goes on in the verse, for he shall cause Israel to inherit the land. So you want to encourage somebody to go on because it's a blessing for everybody. Amen? You have the same truth in Deuteronomy 3.28. Charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. Why? For he shall go over before this people and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. So there's a purpose in that. When we dishearten somebody, we take their courage away. When we encourage, not discourage, this is take away, and is the gift. So when we encourage somebody, we're encouraging them to do the right thing. David encouraged the men, 
And in Joshua's time, the men encouraged Joshua. So it works both ways. There are positive people and negative people. We have all positive people in our church. Amen? So you probably, maybe you've never met a negative person, right? Some people you just don't want to say, hey, how you doing? <laughs> you know, but uh, there are positive and there are uh, negative. There are encouraging people and there are discouraging people. And we're all aware of that. Sometimes people have a day when they want to encourage everybody. And then sometimes we all have a day when we're not very encouraging to someone else. There are thoughts that make us hopeless and thoughts that bring us hope. That's why the Bible says, think on these things. Because if you think on these things, you're going to lose your hope. You're going to be discouraged. It doesn't take long. To think, if you're thinking about the wrong things, it doesn't take long to go down in the, down in the valley. Um, in the world, ye shall have tribulation. If the verse stopped there, we'd be in trouble. But God says, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. God always puts that on the end of his verses. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Jacob, in the Old Testament, said, all these things are against me. No, they were all working for his good, but he just thought they were against him. So we take what God says, amen? Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire, desire cometh, it's a tree of life. So there's discouragement, there's encouragement. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within thee? Hope thou in God, for he shall yet deliver thee. So God does that. We are in Deuteronomy chapter 20, and we will begin reading in verse 1. This is before Israel goes into the land, and God is giving them instruction on how to fight battles. I don't know if you've seen the news lately, but SEAL Team 6 uh, went in and... Um, and rescued over in Africa, they rescued a man that was taken captive by some enemies, you know, that wanted uh, just some money. And uh, SEAL Team 6 got the call to go in, and they did. They delivered this man. They rescued him. There were no um, casualties on our side. Uh, but the, they said about the members of SEAL Team 6, whenever something comes up like that, they pray that they'll get the green light. They are not afraid of going. They can't wait to go because there's a cause. They're going to free somebody. They're going to release somebody. And that's what you have over and over in the Bible. Is there not a cause? David said, let's go. Uh, Esther, well, for such a time as this, she came into the kingdom. So you have all those things. But look at the instruction here. Verse 1, Deuteronomy 20. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when ye are, are come nigh unto the battle, and the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not, do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. He describes it four different ways. He wants to make sure they understand. Don't be afraid, don't tremble, don't fear. We go on to verse 4. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Let him go and return. Verse 6. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. Go and return. Verse 7. And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house lest he die in the battle and another man take her. And the officer shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? 
Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Distracted people distract people. And so God's instruction here is if this is going on or this is going on, they're distracted by possessions, by pleasure, by plans, by pressure. All these distractions, they can't be victorious in the battle. They have their mind on something else. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So God is saying when somebody is distractive, send him home because he will distract other people. I think that's an important thing to read. The same principle is found in Judges chapter 7. Gideon, who is a judge in Israel, God uh, lifted him up to do that, and he told him to go and defeat the Midianites. The Midianites' army was as the sand of the sea. I mean, they were just a lot of, a lot of soldiers. And Gideon had 32,000. But against them, it wasn't too many. So anyway, God spoke to Gideon, and God said to Gideon, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart. That's what this is saying here in Deuteronomy chapter 20. So God is consistent. He said if he's fearful and he's afraid, let him depart. So out of 32,000, 22,000 went, went away because they were fearful. And distracted men distract men. God is going to get the victory. He can save by many or by few. That's what Jonathan and his armor bearer said. So, and they won a great victory over the Philistines. But anyway, so you had 10,000 now. But the Lord wanted to try them. And if you've read the story, you know he did. did. 9,700 of those 10,000 left. So Gideon's got 300. 300. And we'll look at that a little bit later. But you know the end of the story, right? 300. They won the victory because God fought for them. That's what God is saying here in Deuteronomy 22. There's another text in the Old Testament that says God is a man of war. And that means he is victorious. He is more powerful than the enemy. Amen and amen. In Exodus chapter 14, you don't have to turn there. I will get there in a minute. Uh, the children of Israel, they... The plagues have come on Egypt. They're free now. They're going out. And um, as they go, Pharaoh is after them. They're getting ready to go up to the Red Sea. And they turn around and they look. And the Bible says, they said, behold, the Egyptians. That's what they saw. They didn't see the hand of God, not until the waters parted. But they had seen one plague after another where God did this, this, this. As you look back in your Christian life, can't you see a number of times when God did impossible things for you? You know, things maybe you prayed about and, and nobody else could have done it for you, but God did it. And you look back, and isn't it funny how that sometimes we get into a mess or there's a problem or a, a weight on us and we forget about what God did for us, you know? But here's the children of Israel. Behold the Egyptians. Now, I could add, that's chapter 14, in chapter 12, I think it's verse 38, but it says, a mixed multitude went out with them. And so that mixed multitude could have been the ones that influenced people over here. Behold the Egyptians. And then this is what they said. They said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it is better, it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto them, Give me liberty or give me death. Oh no, Moses didn't say that. Somebody else said that. And Moses said unto them, um, Fear ye not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, and he will show to you you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And they went forward across the Red Sea. God defeated the enemy. Amen? The enemy of our souls is the devil. We might not be fighting the Philistines or the Midianites or the Syrians today, but we fight 
the prince of the power of the air, the rulers of spiritual wickedness in high places. But God, of course, gives us the victory. There was a song that uh, I learned in a glee club when I was in eighth grade. I'm not going to sing it. My voice has changed much since the eighth grade. But you may know the song. One of the verses is, Give me some men who are stout-hearted men, who will fight for the right they adore. Start me with ten who are stout-hearted men, and I'll soon give you ten thousand more. Shoulder to shoulder and bolder and bolder, they grow as they go to the fore. Then there's nothing in the world can halt or mar a plan when stout-hearted men can stick together man to man. And God says that too. God just needs an instrument, amen, to show himself strong on their behalf. And those truths are in the Bible. Um, this is a true story. Uh, the British were fighting in the Boer War, B-O-E-R, in Africa years and years ago. But it says, it is reported that during the siege of Ladysmith, a civilian was arrested, tried by court-martial, and sentenced to a year's imprisonment for being a discourager. It's interesting. The man would go along the picket line saying disheartening words to the men on duty. He struck no blows for the enemy. He was not disloyal to the country, but he was a discourager. It was a critical time. The fortunes of the town and its brave garrisons were trembling in the balance. Instead of heartening the men on whom the defense depended and making them braver and stronger, he put faintness into their hearts and made them less courageous. The court martial judged it a crime to speak disheartening words at such a time, and the court martial was right. They put him in jail because he was a discourager. Man, if that was on the books today, there'd be a lot of people in jail. Amen? And uh, we talk about politics. I preached on politics last week. Man, you can get awful discouraged. And there are people that are discouragers in that. You know, there's not a lot of positivity coming out of that. But we live <clears throat> as believers in perilous times. They are here. And it gives you the list in Timothy. And we look at that list and we see their perilous times. So in perilous times, we don't want to discourage each other. Oh, man, I wonder what it's going to be like tomorrow. Oh, man, did you see the news? Oh, man. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and rather than, hey, God's in control. Amen? And uh, God works all things for good to them that love God. Um, Genesis chapter 25 Esau and Jacob are brothers. Esau is the firstborn. And uh, Isaac, the uh, father, is going to bestow the blessing of the firstborn on one of the boys. Well, Esau was a man of the forest. He was a hunter, and Jacob was a little more refined than that. And the Bible says in Genesis 25, 30, Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Faint means weak. Faint-heartedness means a weak heart, but I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. You're faint? I got food? Sell me your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? I am at the point to die. He's carrying on a conversation with his brother. He just came in, so he had the strength to get there. Amen? I mean, I think it's a little exaggeration. I am at the point to die. And I don't think Jacob would have let him die. You know, come on, sell your birth. You know, I don't think he would have done that. But the Bible says that Jacob did sell Esau's birthright. In verse 34, thus Esau despised his birthright. He sold it, and because he sold it, because in carnal, carnality, he, he decided that the flesh was more important than the spirit. He sold that birthright. That was an important thing for that, that young man. There's one text in the book of Hebrews that refers back to that story. It's Hebrews 12, 16, and it says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person. A fornicator is someone who is lewd, 
given to unlawful indulgence of lust. That's what a fornicator is. There's, that's a big umbrella. Profane is irreverent, a contempt of holy things, of sacred things, of spiritual things. That's what a profane person is. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. He sold his birthright. He sold something very spiritual for something carnal. Why? Because he was faint. Because he was weak. And he did that. And if we're weak in the flesh and not strong in the spirit, that can happen. Judges chapter 8, verse 4. Gideon came to Jordan and passed over, he and the 300 men that were with him. This is the 300 men that we talked about earlier in the message. They're, they fought the Midianites, the Midianites took off running, and, and, and uh, um, Gideon and his 300 men are following that great group of, of soldiers. And it says the 300 men that were with him, and then it says, faint yet pursuing faint yet pursuing they were weak in the flesh <clears throat> but they had the spiritual drive to follow after those men <clears throat> excuse me to be an overcomer many times the spiritual can overcome a weakness in the flesh and many times a weakness of the flesh can overcome the spiritual that's why we want to be strong in spirit amen it's like the old illustration I gave. You got a black dog and a white dog. The black dog rep represents the flesh. The white dog represents the, the spirit. The dog that you feed is going to be the stronger of the two dogs. If you starve one, it's going to get weak. If you feed the other, they're going to get strong. So all it takes, we fight the flesh all the time. Amen? The works of the flesh. And we want to be filled with the spirit. So we want to feed that. And God will show us how to do that in just a minute. In 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 10, David pursued he and the 400 men, for 200 ab abode behind and were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. The men <coughs> that... See the fly? You didn't see him? Okay, I shouldn't have done that then. But, but he's around there. I don't think it was a... Uh, fly. I think it was a bee. No, I think it was a hornet. No, I think we all ought to get worried. There's probably a nest somewhere and say what happens, you know, you don't want to do that. But uh, so David takes 400 men and he's going after the enemy. This is where Zig Ziklag was burned. And he's going after them, but 200 men, the next verse tells us, they were so faint they could not go. Physically, they were so faint, they could not go out and fight. You know, that happens sometimes. I am going to be disappointed if Ida doesn't show up to put those timbers down out there. I am really, I mean, isn't she spiritual? Amen. Shouldn't she be out there doing that? I'll sit in here inside, drink my coffee. No, sometimes there are physical limitations. Haven't you been so tired you just needed to take a nap? I'm like that every day at 12 o'clock. You know, you eat lunch, and it just goes right to your eyelids, you know. But uh, sometimes we're just so weak that we can't go on. But when David came back with the spoil, the men that went with him did not want David to divide the spoil with the 200 that stayed by the stuff. But David said, no, the, they're going to divide the same. They stayed by the stuff as we went out to the battle. They were too faint to go. We're all going to part alike. The Bible says that. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful truth because that keeps us from pride. It keeps us from thinking that we're doing something that nobody else can do and we're paying the price when other people aren't paying the price. Sometimes somebody can only stay at home and pray about something. That's all they can do. It's okay. The Lord knows all about that. Sometimes the spiritual cannot overcome the physical. It's just too worn out physically. Matthew 26, 41, Jesus said to the disciples, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Because the Lord knows this. He said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. We, what do we know as believers? We know that prayer is good. Amen? 
We know that Bible reading is good. Bible memorization is good. Witnessing is good. Church attendance is good. All of these things where we want to be faithful to the Lord. Amen? How we treat one another. A soft answer turneth away wrath. All of these different principles. Seek after wisdom. With all thy getting, get understanding. And we quote verses all afternoon up here. But sometimes we just don't do that. Our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. Paul said that in the book of Romans. He says, the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. And the things I want, I, I, I want to do, did I say that right? I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing right. Sometimes that's the way it is. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, I had good intentions. <laughs> Amen. But sometimes the intentions just didn't work out too good. There's so many examples in the Bible of sometimes people were weak physically, but were strong spiritually. So it works both ways. In Proverbs 24.10, if thou faint, lose courage, become weak, in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. And we know that. If we're out doing something and we just got to sit down and take a break, we know that our strength has ebbed away. We know that our strength is small, and there's a way to get that strength back. Spiritually, it's the same thing. When we're spiritually weak, and we don't have that spiritual strength to persevere, to go on, to get something done for God, or to be close to the Lord, or pray for somebody, when that, that is weak, then we know that there is a problem there. Amen? And so God wants to fix that problem in us. There's a verse in Proverbs that also says, if you can't uh, keep up with the footman, how will you ever run with the horses? And so we, we, we look at our lives and we say, am I weak spiritually? Am I weak physically? If I'm weak physically, what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what I do. I, I take care of my body. I make sure I get my daily ration of chocolate. Amen. Uh, my cup of coffee, my cup of coffee. That's just a wonderful thing for the flesh. Amen. Two, three, four cups of coffee, right? Amen? There's a guy, there's a guy back there, the coffee drinker. Don't ever go to breakfast or lunch with Richard. Amen? He drinks two or three pots of coffee. I'm kidding. But there are things that we know to do to give us physical strength. But the spiritual realm, amen? If we can't keep up with the footmen, how will we ever run with the horses? We need that physical strength. There's a way to renew physical strength, and there's a way to renew spiritual strength. I'll just give you some verses here. Isaiah 40, verse 29 through 31. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with eagles. Wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Well, I want something a little deeper. I want something a little, you know, something I've never heard before. No, line upon line, precept upon precept. Other foundation can no man lay which is laid. Amen. It's Christ Jesus. It's the truth of the word of God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, their spiritual strength. You have Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. There it is. How do you wait on the Lord? Well, you can do it with the Bible, but it's a, it's a quiet time. Amen? Be still and know that I am God. Know that I am the Lord. And so we're just still. We want to hear his voice. So we wait on him. We have in Luke 18, 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. God uses these words so that they can all be tied together. So there's no question of what he's talking about. Okay, the faint-heartedness, we see that. That's not good when you're going to fight the enemy. We're fighting a spiritual enemy. Amen? And so when we fight the spiritual enemy, we don't want that faint-heartedness because that will cause our strength to go, but it causes us to affect other people around us too. So wait upon the Lord, pray. You have 2 Corinthians 4.1. 1. 
Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we've received mercy, we faint not. We remember how merciful God has been to us. There's a strengthening effect in that. Amen? We think about it. 2 Corinthians 4.16 For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. There's a cause. There's a cause, the cause of Christ. And the outward man is perishing. It's getting weaker and weaker. But the inward man is renewed day by day. There are some physically weak people in the world that are spiritually strong. And their spiritual strength is such an encouragement to other people, even though physically they're not doing what they wanted to do or what they used to do. But they're so encouraging. They're so full of hope. They're so passionate about God and His work and His people that they encourage other people. You have Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we... What's that word? We shall reap if we faint not. Yeah. If we don't faint, we will see a blessing. So we look towards the future, the promise of fruit. Ephesians 3.13, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulation for you, which is for your glory. You have Hebrews 12.3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So we look for the joy that's set before us. Hebrews 12, 5. For ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Why? Because he does that for our good. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Amen? So that we might be partakers of that fruit of righteousness. Why is it so important to be strong in the inward man? Why is it so important to keep our hearts with all diligence? It's so important because what man is there is fearful and faint-hearted. Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. We go to Numbers chapter 13, and there's an interesting story there. I think we mentioned some of it uh, last week, but Moses sends the 12 spies in to spy out the land, and uh, it's a good land. It's a land that God gave them, but the 10 bring back an evil report, and Joshua and Caleb bring back the good report. The 10 men said, we are not able to go, and Joshua and Caleb, we are well able to go. Let's do that now. So there were two encouragers to what God said, not to the circumstances, but to what God said. And there were 10 discouragers because they saw the circumstances and not the promise of God. And so we'll pick it up in verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the man that went up with him said, we, are, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we, and they brought up an evil report of the land. And they talked about all the negative things, all of the things that you would look at and say, boy, that's never going to work. Man, that's a dangerous situation. We better, not, we better not go there. There's giants in that land, and we are like grasshoppers. It isn't going to work. Well, didn't God say it's our land? Yeah, but look at the circumstances. You ever, you ever get there? I mean, you can probably be there every other minute. But chapter 14, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Why? Because they believed the evil report. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses, against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? That's what we read already in Deuteronomy. You have, and wherefore hath the Lord brought us up into this land to fall by the sword, and our wives, our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they made, and they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. They just wanted to go back to Egypt. And so there was a, a judgment on them because of that, and so they wandered in the wilderness. 
And I heard a preacher preach one time, and he said, a lot of people are still just wandering in the wilderness. God says, go in and possess the land. Amen? Enter into my rest. All you that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me. You know, in all of the scriptures where God says this is possible, but we look at the circumstances, we look at the opposition, and we just keep on wandering. And we never experience that spiritual strength. It's all the, if I can put everything together carnally, temporally, man, I will be so happy. I will be so strong of a Christian if I could just get all these things together. Just when you take the two ends and you think you're going to get them together, somebody pulls a rope, right? But God has a plan, and he wants to be our strength. Prayer, Bible reading, amen? Time with him. All of these wonderful principles. Numbers 32, 9. For when they went up into the valley of Eskel and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go up into the land which the Lord had given him. That's Numbers 32. We just read Numbers 13. So when they're go getting ready to go into the land, that principle is still affecting them. There's a couple tribes that they don't want to go in and possess the land. We got cattle. This is a land for cattle. You guys go fight the enemy. We're just going to take a break. And he says it's the same principle. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Um, troubled people, troubled people. Discouraged people, discouraged people. Encouraged people, encouraged people. You have um, Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So if I'm bitter and you get around me, a lot of that bitterness is going to wear off. Amen? If I'm encouraged, you can't help but be encouraged. Amen? Don't you like to be around encouraging people? And you can't always be around. So David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's where that personal relationship is. It is a rare person who doesn't get discouraged. We are all going to get discouraged. You say, yeah, I'm discouraged right now. I think you're over the time of preaching. But I'm encouraged, amen? Well, two people smiled, amen. Okay, I'll just keep looking down. Then I won't be discouraged. Whether it happens to us as an associate, us or to an associate we're trying to cheer up, the answer always centers around one word, perseverance. Amen? Perseverance that the trial of your faith, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Patience, patience. And so through patience, we persevere. And it isn't long before we see God's hand again. There are times that you'll be discouraged, but be careful you don't discourage somebody else during that time. Even Paul said there's a, there's a good time not to write letters. Amen. But that was before the phone. Amen? And so there's a good time not to call somebody. Well, I'm just going to call. I just, I just got to dump this. You know, a person at the other end of the line is going, whoa, you know. Maybe they're having a hard time too. Cripple him, and you have a Sir Walter Scott. Lock him in a prison cell, and you have a John Bunyan. Bury him in the snows of Valley Forge, and you have a George Washington. Raise him in abject poverty, and you have an Abraham Lincoln. Strike him down with infantile paralysis, and he becomes Franklin Roosevelt. Burn him so severely that the doctors say he'll never walk again, and you have a Glenn Cunningham, who in, I think it was 1934, broke the record for running the mile. Deafen him, and you have a Ludwig, Ludwig von Beethoven. Have him or her born black in a society filled with racial discrimination, and you have a Booker T. Washington, a Marian Anderson, a George Washington Carver. Call him a slow learner. Call him retarded. Write him off as uneducable, and you have an Albert Einstein. As one man summed it up, 
Life is about 20% in what happens to us and 80% in how we respond to the events. Amen? You say, I'm really going through some things. Everybody is. A.W. Tozer wrote a book, and one of the chapters is There's No Soft Crosses. There's a burden, there's a load, there's a trial, there's a tribulation. We all go through them. Sometimes it's more severe than another time. There are fightings and fears within and without. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Amen. The circumstances will absolutely destroy us many times. But all things work together for good. Someone asked an ex-paratrooper how many jumps he had made, and he responded by saying, none, but I was pushed out 18 times. He didn't jump. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. And sometimes God knows he has to give us a push. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Joshua and Caleb. They're usually always in the minority. Usually. Doesn't have to always be that way, but usually that is the case. And they are so strong, so close. They're like David. They know with God, with God, if God be for us, who can be against us? The Apostle Paul wrote that. And look what he went through. And all of the physical, all of the circumstantial, all of the temporal, he said, the things that are now are temporal. The things that are going to be in the future are eternal. Let's be strong. Amen? Let's encourage one another. Let's find a way where we can get alone with God and wait on Him and pray and let Him speak to us and remember the mercies and look for the joy set before us and, and look at the fruit that's going to be come if we just stay close to the Lord. And then let's be encouraged by that. And let's take that encouragement and encourage others. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads, please. Give me some men who are stout-hearted men, and I'll soon give you 10,000 more. Our Father, we... We count it a privilege to know you, to serve you, to love you, to experience you. Come into our hearts, Lord, and just strengthen us. Increase our faith. Help our unbelief. God, in weakness, make us strong. We need your help, Lord. Help us not to be half-hearted. Help us to be strong in our hearts. For your honor and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please.